Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I'm Dr. John Oldham, Chief of Staff at the Menninger Clinic, and welcome back to our series of podcasts uh, that we refer to as Menninger Mindscape. My guest today is Dr. Peter Fonicky, um, and we're delighted, Peter, that you're able to join us. Uh, for those who don't know Dr. Fonicky, and many of you do, I'm sure, um, he is the Freud Memorial Professor of Psychoanalysis and head of the Research Department of Clinical, Educational, and Health Psychology at University College London, or UCL. Um, in addition, he's director of something we're going to talk about today called the Partners Mental Health and Wellbeing Program, which is a very interesting health program in the UK. Um, Peter does a lot of things. I can only mention a couple of additional credentials. He's been consultant to the Child and Family Program here at the Menninger Clinic and here in our Department of Psychiatry at Baylor. Um, he started out being a consultant in Topeka when Menninger was located there and has continued to be uh, joining us um, and we're delighted that he's on our adjunct faculty. He's also on the adjunct faculty at Harvard and at Yale and is a busy man. Um, his good work has led to many, many recognitions and honors. I do have to mention one recent one, which is that Peter was conferred the Order of the British Empire called an OBE by the Queen, uh, which is a very, very high honor uh, in the UK. So congratulations, Peter. Thank you very much, John. Very kind of you. So today, I thought it would be interesting to hear a little bit from you about the wonderful initiative that you're a leader among um, in health promotion, health uh, improvement. Um, in the greater London area, I guess, of a population of about six million. And it comes under the heading of uh, the Academic Health Science Partnership. Tell us a little bit about that, because I think it's very innovative, and you've really got a responsible, heavy-duty load um, in, this, in this effort. Uh, it's, a, it's a most exciting, uh, it's the most exciting job that I've been asked to do recently. A major problem within healthcare delivery in every country is the time that we spend between innovation and uh, delivery uh, in healthcare. 17 years passes between a new idea uh, being invented in uh, some bench somewhere and it finding its way into practice. Academic health science networks link health uh, practice in the UK with academic uh, progress in order to shorten that time and make sure that patients population might benefit as quickly as possible uh, from uh, progress uh, on the side of research. And you, you didn't make that 17-year figure up. I did not make the 17-year figure up. That is the average number of years that it takes between a discovery uh, being made and that uh, finding its way to general practice. Way too long. Way too long for most of us. So what are you doing? We um, are here to try and support uh, clinicians working uh, across a very large area, geographical area, uh, within North Central, North East London, to uh, improve their practice, uh, making best use of available uh, scientific evidence. We recognize that issuing guidance, uh, publishing in papers, just doesn't do it. People, doctors in the field need support in order to uh, implement uh, good new ideas. Let me give you just one example. Um, within child mental health care, we now have extremely effective uh, treatments that are currently, in the UK at least, are not generally uh, used. Cognitive behavior therapy, for example, for obsessive compulsive disorder is not generally available. What we are doing is training clinicians in evidence-based practice uh, in, in particular areas, but in addition to that, also initiating a, a routine outcomes monitoring of each patient uh, that is uh, uh, being treated. And in addition to that, we have implemented um, a, a process that more or less obliges um, uh, healthcare professionals to work collaboratively in shared decision-making uh, with uh, uh, their patients, with their uh, young patients. 
these initiatives, all by just uh, uh, taking them one at a time, would improve um, outcomes by about five or ten percent each. When you combine them, uh, with health economics colleagues, we've calculated that you have improved efficiency, improved value, about 15 percent. Uh, and we are actually fairly close to achieving it, even in the first year of this program. That's very interesting. So a buzzword we hear all the time now is evidence-based practice, or person-centered evidence-based practice. Yeah. And these are good goals that we all need to work toward. What you're saying is it's not so much a workforce numbers problem as helping people learn how to implement what has been demonstrated to be effective. It's partly a training problem. Um, but actually, we don't just train um, clinicians. That uh, probably wouldn't be enough. We also train supervisors, mm -hmm. and we also train managers uh, in evidence-based practice so that entire system-wide changes are possible within uh, child and adolescent mental health services uh, because both at all levels, um, everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing and what will make uh, for uh, significant improvements in healthcare. Very interesting. Now, you were telling me, we were chatting earlier, that mental health is one of three priorities in this effort and this program. How did that happen? Well, uh, there we've got uh, uh, two other priorities, uh, cancer and cardiovascular disease. The third is mental health. The first two is, I think the pressure is primarily uh, from the consumers, from patients. Uh, the last in mental health, the uh, pressure is mainly from uh, commissioners because mental health is the most expensive specialty. Uh, and achieving greater efficiency in mental health is in everyone's interest. Well, it's interesting because the economics may be the motor that's going to sort of drive this. And yet, it's partly expensive because treatments that work are not well known. And also, there's a the huge stigma, which I'm sure is a huge problem as well, so that patients don't identify. Um, what they're experiencing as something like depression, but instead come to see their regular doctor and it's not, it, it's not really recognized. There is, uh, you're absolutely right, there is uh, in the UK uh, a massive problem uh, with underdiagnosis. But uh, we've actually made substantial progress with that. Uh, a more important problem uh, is um, that the treatments that are offered are not the quality. Uh, that uh, they would need to be. And if those treatments were offered for cancer or for cardiovascular, the same level, the same quality, there'll be an outcry. Interesting. Uh, huh. uh, so improving that is a, is a major problem. But the a second problem that we found is that the treatments that are offered are not necessarily the treatments that the patients want. Uh, and particularly adolescent uh, with depression, uh, prescribed uh, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, do not take those uh, because the decision making about treatment is not shared between uh, the young person uh, and the clinician. So even when the treatment is right and the prescription is right, the treatment doesn't happen? Uh, the prescription may be right, but if the decision for that treatment wasn't made jointly between the patient and uh, the prescribing doctor, it is not likely to be taken up what you have is wasted resources. Uh, the majority of uh, adolescents take two of those pills uh, and then uh, give up the rest of it. Uh, so it's... Uh, uh, two doesn't go very far. It? it does not go very far. It, it does not cure the disorder. So what we are trying to do is uh, train doctors in shared decision making uh, where they uh, uh, are able to bring uh, the patient to see the problems from their point of view, as well as them going over to see the uh, problem from the patient's point of view, why they might not want a particular treatment is probably as important for them to understand as for them to explain why the patient should have that treatment. So part of what is sort of the principle embedded in your effort is helping people understand the importance of talking to their patients and making sure you listen to feedback from patients and families. That's, uh, uh, that's, there are three legs to our stool. The first is that you should be doing the right thing and you should be trained in it. 
The second is that you should deliver it in a way that's collaborative uh, with the patient. And the third is clinical observation. You have to make clinical observation systematic for it to work. Clinicians always think that they know how a patient is doing, but very often they actually fail to ask the patient how the patient thinks they are doing. So we are imposing a, a, a fairly rigorous system of uh, asking patients to report on, at the end of a session, the, uh, the uh, therapist has to ask patients, what did you think of that session? Do you feel that you benefited from it? Did it achieve for you what you needed? What we find in this way is that when treatments are going off piece, they're going wrong, clinicians are able to recognize this sooner, bring it back uh, in line, and a lot of wasted effort uh, is uh, avoided. Right. And this is so interesting and so relevant in all of healthcare, no matter which country you're talking about. And certainly in this country, that would be very important for us to watch and learn from. Um, I wish we had more time. We never do. One last question. How are you going to find out if what you're doing works or not? We uh, are very rigorous in evaluating uh, across our entire patch how each of the services, and there are very many services that uh, there are several thousand clinicians that uh, fit into this six million patch. So we re very rigorous in the amount of measuring the outcomes that we observe and the amount of money that we spend. And what we are trying to do is to identify best value following Michael Porter's principles, uh, where best value is being delivered uh, in any particular disorder for any particular uh, problem across our page, combine uh, this learning to define, help define for each of the services what they can learn from other services, how they can do best. What we are finding is that each service can teach all the other services one or two things. Uh, and we are very much hoping that through this integration of services, we will have far better outcomes for the entire population that we serve. Very interesting. Peter, thank, I, mean, I wish we had more time, but thank you for giving us the, the, the high points uh, about a very interesting program. Um, I hope in a couple of years we can have you back and you can give us an update uh, and tell us what you've learned because we need to learn from uh, efforts like this. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for watching, uh, and we look forward to seeing you on another Mindcast podcast. Um, thanks very much.